Ko te wai e hora nei, ko te papa e takoto nei e te whaia, papa tu ānuku. Ko koutou a haku rangatira kua pai nei tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kā nui ngā mihi aroha ki a koutou katoa. Last month, and this has already been quoted, but it's worth quoting again, Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, stood before world leaders and issued a very stark warning. He said, our world is in big trouble. We are in rough seas. Trust is crumbling. People are hurting. The most vulnerable suffering the most. Our planet is burning. He might as well have opened his speech by calling out, kia hiwara, kia hiwara, because it was a sentry cry, a clarion call, to try and wake up the world in the face of imminent risks to human survival. He went on to say, excellencies, there's one battle we must end, our suicidal war against nature. And the best of the world's scientists share his sense of urgency. At a meeting of Nobel Prize winners last year, Sandra Diaz, an Argentinian ecologist who was talking alongside James Cameron of Gaia fame, she said, we have incontestable evidence that the living fabric of the earth is being unraveled fast. The only reason this is happening is the president dominant model of appropriating nature. Runaway climate change, massive biodiversity losses, and intolerable social and environmental inequality among people are simply the three most serious symptoms of the same root problem. They must be tackled together. Time and time again, the speakers at that symposium stressed the interconnected nature of these crises and an urgent need to change habits of mind based on the separation of people from nature and from each other. The fragmentation of living systems and the earth is created for human purposes. At present, old mythologies, the creation story in the Bible, for example, or the great chain of being, have fostered this idea that human beings were created to rule over nature and all other life forms, and that some humans were created to rule over others, for example, the 1% over the 99%. Instead of Homo sapiens, maybe right now our species ought to be renamed Homo hubris. Blinded as we are by short-term thinking and anthropocentric illusions. As Guterres has warned, we are, there's something fundamentally wrong with the way that we human beings are thinking and behaving at, at the present time, putting our own lives and those of our own children and grandchildren at risk. And this is also true of the way we're dealing with our native forests. As Jared Diamond, the naturalist, he described Aotearoa New Zealand as the world's smallest continent or the world's largest islands. For a biologist, he remarks, examining the New Zealand biota is the closest we will get to the opportunity to study life on another planet. And before the first human beings came ashore here, living systems have been co-adapting for about 80 million years, creating an extraordinary array of endemic species, including flightless birds, giant snails, walking bats, ancient trees. Our native forests are unique in the world, and they're precious. The ancestors of many of these species had to survive a long, difficult oceanic or airborne journey, and adapt to environments very different from those in their homelands. And as they moved into new niches, this sparked rapid innovation and the emergence of new species. Something very similar seemed to have happened here with human beings. Aotearoa was the last significant landmass on the planet to be found and settled by human beings. We've only been here for about the blink of an eye, perhaps 800 years compared with 80 million years of independent evolution for many plants and animals. 
And when the first star navigators stepped ashore in these islands, they too found landscapes and climates so different from their tropical homelands that they had to rapidly adapt and invent new ways of living. And this happened differently in different parts of the country. As Te Rangihiroa, uh, Sir Peter Buck used to say, Aotearoa is like a Pacific archipelago with islands linked by land instead of by water. In the different regions, very different kinds of native forests were cleared for gardens and fern root diggings. Kia ore and kuri, the native uh, dog, uh, the uh, Polynesian dog and rat were introduced and birds were hunted, some to extinction. But at the same time, this was a kin-based world. In some accounts, Tane Nuya Rangi, ancestor of forest and birds, Tane Mahuta, Step was Hine Ahuone, the heaped up earth from his mother, Papa, uh, Papa Tuaanuku, the first woman, made from earth, creating human beings. The permission of the Atua had to be asked before trees could be felled and birds could be taken. So forests and people, as TK was saying, are close kin. And when the next wave of settlers arrived from Europe and elsewhere, maybe 450 years later, most did not share this kind of sense of kinship with the land and the forest, at least at first. They were holding fast to hierarchical models of the cosmos, from the story of the Garden of Eden to the great chain of being that put human beings in charge of the world. So in the book of Genesis, for example, when God creates Adam and Eve, he commands them to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth and subdue it, and gives them dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds in the heavens and every plant and every tree. And in the great chain of being, this old starts with the Greeks, goes down into medieval times with its contemporary reflexes, God sat at the top of the cosmic hierarchy, followed by archangels and angels, a divine king, aristocrats and commoners in so-called civilized societies with men over women, and civilized people over barbarians, and savages, sentient and non-sentient animals, insects, plants, and rocks. Papa Tuanuku with her forests are, is at the very bottom of the great chain of being, expected to offer up homage and tribute to human beings. In many ways, we're still acting out these fantasies with our corporate hierarchies and our talk of ecosystem services. Despite all the evidence to the contrary, we still think we're in charge of the cosmos, and we can make nature do our bidding. This is a massive self-deception, however, as Guterres points out, on a suicidal scale, as is the fate, as the fate of our natural forests makes clear. Several months ago, in a scientist warning to humanity, a very distinguished Gladium cons global consortium of scientists warned that around the world, one third of tree species are at risk of extinction, and the loss of indigenous forests is putting the future of our own species at risk. As they point out, natural forests provide at least one third of the world's accessible fresh water. They protect soils, streams, rivers, and harbors, and hold more carbon than the Earth's atmosphere. They provide homes for 80% of amphibium species 75% of bird species, 68% of the world's mammal species, and the vast majority of the world's invertebrate species, along with other megadiverse groups, including soil bacteria, fungi, and nematodes. These very distinguished scientists warned in the most urgent terms that the loss of native forests is triggering disruptions in the carbon cycle, in the water cycle and other fundamental planetary processes, and triggering off extinction cascades that are putting human survival at risk. They concluded and advised that natural forests must be protected, restored, and expanded as a key strategy in the fight against climate change. The scientific consensus around the risks to natural forests and what we should do about climate change is now about as strong as the consensus around climate change itself. So for example, in the latest intergovernmental panel on climate change, the A6 report, they urged the use of natural forests for carbon sequestration, 
while placing the planting of large-scale non-native monocultures, which would lead to the loss of biodiversity and poor climate change resilience as, quote, among the worst practices and negative adaptation trade-offs for temperate forests. In the Royal Society UK 2021 and its report Biodiversity and Climate Change strongly recommends restoring native woodlands and strongly advises against establishing large monoculture tree plantations as long-term carbon sinks. The report from the joint workshop of the panels, the, the COP panels on biodiversity and climate change strongly dis discouraged ecosystem-based approaches to climate change that have negative outcomes for biodiversity, while strongly encouraging the restoration and expansion of native forests. So the scientific consensus is clear and it's getting clearer by the moment. We've got a COP coming up on climate change and one on biodiversity in the next couple of months. So you would think that making sure that the restoration and expansion of native forests was an absolutely pivotal pillar in our climate change strategy in New Zealand would be a no-brainer, particularly when we are a country that has one of the highest pr proportion of endemic species at risk of extinction. And there was an opportunity uh, that was foreshadowed very early on in this conference of reserving a new category, an incoming category in the ETS of permanent forests for native forests. And to, there was a chance there to make this financially competitive with pine trees, that particular permanent forest category. And having signaled this, they then kind of changed their minds. And we have to recognize that this is flatly contrary to global scientific advice about how we should be tackling offsetting and carbon sequestration. So instead of supporting the restoration and expansion of native forests and making this financially viable for landowners, and TK was pointing out precisely how, how, the, how the scales are tipped against native forests, you just can't afford to do it if you're a, a landowner on, on the East Coast, for example. The rewards are so great, 10 times more for planting pine trees than they are for restoring native forests in those highly erodible landscapes. We've, we've taken even that category and made it available for monocultures of short-lived, shallow-rooting, flammable Pinus radiata as permanent forests instead. And as Rod Carr said at the end of his talk this morning, if you were looking at all the species to choose for long-term carbon sequestration, sort of given the risks associated fire, pests, diseases, at a time of climate change, it's probably not the species that would come to the top of your list. It might well be pretty near the bottom. But the points that TK and others have made are very, they're true. You know, what, the points he was making about the barriers and the costs for those that want to restore native forests, want to follow the advice of the global scientific community. In this, our country, Aotearoa, the barriers are great, and the financial incentives are all in the opposite direction. We've talked about collaboration and balance, the aspirations we all have for native forests in Aotearoa at the moment, but where are the incentives? They're all tipped in favor of exotic monocultures, and we just have to recognize this is flatly contrary to global scientific advice about how we should pursue offsetting. And there are these farmers, for example, who are planting up riverbanks, and some of them will be speaking this afternoon, and steep eroding slopes and gullies with native forests. It would have been easy to give them an income for that work. It would be easy to give an income to Māori landowners for the large stretches of native bush on their land. And this is when the rest of the ETS is already dedicated to covering vast swathes of our landscapes with monocultures of pine trees while the planting and protection of native forests is declining. And this puts us in a situation of considerable risk internationally, I think, because if the global scientific advice on how to pursue offsetting is, is, is followed, this kind of offsetting may well be 
removed um, from the international rules around carbon sequestration, in which case our whole system will collapse and many landowners will be left with stranded assets. So it's this combination of lobbying, short-term profit, siloed thinking that's driving climate change itself across the planet and putting the future of our children, our grandchildren, the lives of all these other life forms at risk. So pine plantations, as everyone has said this morning, in the right place are fine. On stable land, not clear felled on highly erodible landscapes, which is just really a, a form of strip mining and when you see it in action, sustainably managed and producing high quality durable products, fine. But this can't possibly replace the protection, the restoration and the expansion of native forest. This isn't nice to have, but a matter of human survival. As Professor Kuda Paul Burke, as a marine scientist, said a couple of days ago, our ocean, our world is dying. So for the sake of our children and grandchildren and their own, if not of the country and the planet, our leaders must listen to the scientists. They have to listen, to be smart, to stand tall, and take care of our beautiful ngahere and our precious land. Nā reira i akuranga tira kā nui ngā mihi aroha ki a koutou katoa, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kā huri. Kā huri.